Welcome to this IEA webinar. My name is Leila, and with my colleague Nikos, we will be introducing you to some of our work on oil use data. On the agenda for today, we'll have a world oil overview, we'll look at an oil energy balance, some uses of oil and oil products, we'll have a discussion on bunkers, data collection, and then the uses of data. So let's start with an introduction to see the relevance of oil in the energy mix and why oil matters. Collecting oil statistics is important and interesting in many aspects. Oil is still the largest energy source in the world, though its share in total primary energy supply has decreased since the IA was founded. It's still the single most significant energy source on the planet. In this presentation, we will focus on the demand side of oil and some key principles guiding how to collect and report oil consumption. Through collecting statistics, we're able to attribute which sectors consume the most and understand what are the drivers of demand growth. For example, just in OECD countries, oil is mainly used for transportation. In fact, despite diversifying energy sources overall, the transport sector relies heavily on oil. Worldwide, a similar trend can be seen, with oil mainly being relied on for transportation. We will focus on the statistical challenges and intricacies with quantifying oil and oil product consumption. Before exploring the end uses for oil, it's important to understand a basic energy balance and know what the oil products are and think about what the flows of those products are going to be. For any energy commodity, first, there's supply data. Total primary energy supply is equal to indigenous production plus imports minus exports and plus or minus stock changes and in international marine or aviation bunkers. Then there is energy transformation, where the energy can be converted to another energy product. In oil, this is easy to imagine as crude oil enters a refinery and comes out as a different energy product, such as gasoline. Some consumption is attributed to energy industry own use, which is different from transformation. Transformation is a conversion of energy, while energy industry own use is how much energy is being consumed in the activities of producing energy, like how much energy is being consumed in a refinery or in an electricity plant to support the activity, of, the activity of the plant. We can think of this as having the lights on in a refinery. Finally, there is total final consumption. This is how energy products are used and generally are categorized into industry, transportation, and other comprising of residential, public and commercial uses, and of course, non-energy uses. This presentation will focus on how we classify types of consumption and how marine and aviation bunkers are counted as we look at oil and oil products. At this point, it is important to differentiate between crude oil and oil products. When we say crude oil, we mean the primary oil product which comes out of a well. It does not have many end uses in this state and must be transformed to usable oil products through a refinery. These are what we call secondary oil products. So when we are discussing end uses, we are mainly talking about secondary oil products. Oil products have diverse end uses. We'll look at examples of different uses, which may seem ambiguous, and classify them appropriately according to the International Recommendation on Energy Statistics. Uses of products are broken down into transformation, energy industry own use, industry, transport, other, and non-energy use categories. We will examine how oil products fit into this balance format and what products are used where and address common confusion points in how to classify oil and oil products end use. Crude oil is mainly used in transformation processes such as refineries. In very few countries, crude oil is also used in electricity plants, which is again energy transformation. Liquid petroleum gas, or LPG, is commonly used in heating appliances or as a cooking fuel in canisters for grills. In a heating appliance, it may be confusing to think at first that this is transformation. However, when LPG is used in an appliance, this is other use. If the appliance is in a home, this is residential, while if the appliance is used in a business or public sector building, this has the designation of commercial and public services. Similarly, gas used for cooking is again residential use. When LPG is used in any type of vehicle, this is transport use. Naphtha is used to dilute heavy oil to help it move through pipelines and is also mixed with heavier oils to upgrade the octane levels of fuels. 
in these cases, this should appear as a negative value under transfers, as the quantities of naphtha are now transferred to a different product. It will also appear as a positive value in the transfers of the product to which it was transferred to. It is also used to clean metal, which is a non-energy use. On a larger scale, naphtha is in the petrochemical industry as a feedstock to, to steam reformers and steam crackers for the production of hydrogen, ethylene, and other olefins. This is non-energy use in industry. Kerosene includes jet kerosene and other kerosenes. It is used in cooking and lighting, which may be commercial or residential, depending on where the cooking or lighting are taking place. It is also used as fuel for tractors. While this may seem at first like a transportation use, it is in fact agriculture. Kerosene is also used in chemical labs for different reasons. It can be used for cleaning materials, which is a non-energy use. Some kerosene is used in chemical labs as a heat source, which is energy use in the chemical sector. Finally, jet kerosene is used in jets for domestic or international flights. We will talk later in the presentation about the differentiation between domestic and international aviation. Gasoline is most commonly thought of of a transportation fuel as it, as it is used in cars, motorbikes, trucks, boats, and other transport vehicles. It is important to note that personal cars are categorized under road transport. All uses of gasoline in a vehicle are transport use. However, a household machine, such as a lawnmower that takes gasoline, is residential use. Similarly, farm equipment which runs on gasoline is agricultural use. Diesel end uses are similar to gasoline as it is mainly used in transport vehicles. Again, as with gasoline, the same distinction is made when diesel is used for household machines or farm equipment, such as a chainsaw. Many other machines take diesel, and those end uses should be classified. For example, a crane used on a construction site, which is powered by diesel, is a construction end use. Diesel is also commonly used in power generators. For example, diesel generators are commonly used to provide electricity on a small scale. A small house without access to an electricity grid may have its own generator. This use of diesel is considered as electricity generation by auto producer. This is a subsector of the electricity plants. Bitumen is used to make roads and construct roofs. While road and building construction may be confusing at first, this is in fact a non-energy use. Paraffin waxes are commonly used in cosmetics, candles, and crayons. These are again non-energy uses. So I'd like to now to pass this presentation off to Nikos to discuss bunkers. At this part, we are going to explain the difference between international marine and aviation bunkers and domestic navigation and aviation. We saw previously the flows of an energy balance. We have seen, though, that sometimes the differentiation between international marine and aviation bunkers and domestic navigation and aviation is frustrating. Let's see first what international marine bunkers and international aviation bunkers stand for. International marine bunkers cover those quantities delivered to ships of all flags that are engaged in international navigation. Oil is used as fuel by the ship and is not part of the cargo. Consumption by ships engaged in domestic navigation is excluded. The domestic international split is determined on the basis of port of departure and port of arrival and not by the flag and nationality of the ship. Consumption by fishing vessels and military forces is also excluded. It is included in fishing subsector and others not specified in transport sector, respectively. Similarly, international aviation bunkers include deliveries of aviation fuels to aircraft for international aviation. Fuels used by airlines for the road vehicles is not included. The domestic international split is determined on the basis of departure and landing locations and not by the nationality of the airline. The international aviation and interna international marine bunkers are subtracted out of supply based on international recommendations on energy statistics. On the other hand, domestic navigation and domestic aviation are on the demand side of the, our energy balance and more specifically under the transport sector. 
Domestic navigation includes fuels delivered to vessels of all flags not engaged in international navigation. This means ships or boats whose port of departure and port of arrival are both at the same country. Domestic aviation includes deliveries of aviation fuels to aircraft for domestic aviation, commercial, private, agricultural, etc. Similarly to domestic navigation, it includes airplanes whose airport of departure and airport of arrival are both at the same country. It also includes use for purposes other than flying, such as bench testing of engines. Data collection and validation is not easy, but it is vital for making sound policy and business decisions. The objective of a collection system is to have detailed and reliable energy data and to facilitate it we need to have. At first, a legal, ba a legal basis, which is provided by statistical laws and other national laws and regulations. It is better to make reporting of energy data mandatory. Secondly, an institutional arrangement. The legal framework creates a necessary but not su sufficient foundation for energy statistics. We need to establish an institutional arrangement to ensure, collect and compile energy statistics in the most efficient way among all relevant members of national energy sti statistics system. It also needs to have a proper reporting and dissemination mechanism questionnaires compatible with international standards, a network of contacts, and an agreed timetable. Finally, we need to allocate proper resources to collect and process the data. We also need to review the methodology, anticipate and adapt the change to meet national and international needs. Collecting any statistics has a cost. We need to know that, despite the cost, a lack of data quality could ultimately be far more costly than data collection and associated activities. A balance must be struck between the efficient use of resources and collecting what is necessary. What is necessary will depend on the needs of data users. However, it is not possible to meet all the needs. It is important to look at the changes in the energy sector and to limit the collecting by cooperation with relevant government agencies. There are some challenges in collecting statistics. In view of the role and importance of energy statistics, one would expect basic energy information to be available, reliable and timely. This is not always the case and there are several reasons behind this. The liberalization of the energy markets, for instance, has two major impacts on statistics. First, while in the past we could obtain detailed information from a single national utility company, now, hundreds of surveys from the companies are requested to have a comprehensive view of a sector. Secondly, a competitive market often leads to confidentiality issues that add to the difficulty of collecting basic information. On top of this, there is a lack of resources and a high turnover in staff. Energy data collection is a complex and costly process and here we will give an overview of types of data collection for energy statistics. At first we have surveys. Countries can collect data by targeting all the population which is called census or they can use subset of representative units selected from the population which is called same survey. Censuses are a more time-consuming and costly exercise, especially for collection of end-use data. There are two different types of surveys depending on sampling units. The enterprise survey and the household survey. Business registers and or lists are used as a frame of the survey. International standards need to be taken into account while de designing the questionnaires, such as the unit of measurement or the definition of energy product and flow. Secondly, we have administration data. Administration data is the data collected for administrative purposes. It may be held by the government or by a public or private company and it can lower the survey burden. But it is dependent on third parties, so cooperation is needed among policymakers, administrations and statisticians. Now, we'll illustrate possible data sources and types of data collection for oil. 
Broadly, there are two main sources to search for oil data, from energy industries or suppliers on the supply side and the energy consumers on the demand side. For supply, data can be provided by the energy industries whose activities directly relate to the production or some part of the supply chain. Data are collected from the energy producers through surveys or with administrative data. Import and export data are usually compiled through the customs office. For demand data, energy consumption is measured through end-use surveys for households and enterprises. This includes surveys to industries, households and businesses which use the oil as well as the distributors which sell oil and oil products. End-use energy statistics surveys are very important instruments for assessing energy consumption activities, tracking the potential for energy efficiency improvements and helping to design the future programs and policies. However, end-use energy statistics for oil are the most complex to compile and understand due to diversity of products and uses, wide distribution networks, mobility and detailed question of forms. It is important that oil production and distribution are monitored at the national level for administrative purposes. Ideally, data collection from various agencies within one country come together to inform a balance on how much oil is produced and distributed to the different consumers. To have full picture of oil supply and demand statistics, an integrated approach needs to be used. This involves using existing surveys, direct measurements and administrative data and complementing the existing data with estimation and modeling tools to fill the gaps in the data set or account for missing or misrepresented statistics. Of course, these methods must be adapted to the changing production and consumption patterns. For example, oil products mainly used in transport may be distributed by a single nationally regulated company or they may have many distributors in a liberalized market. The collection methods will differ in these two cases. We are approaching the end of this presentation and we have talked about the importance of oil in the world, the oil energy balance, the uses of oil, the difference between international marine bankers and domestic aviation navigation, and the data collection. Now I would like to talk about the uses of data. The data collected by the IEA have a multitude of uses. Outside the IEA, the data is used globally by governments, academics, researchers, analysts, investors and other associations. The data can also be used to assess the security of supply, to compare the performance of different countries, to assess how effective the policies are and mostly to make sound policy and business decisions. The foremost use of oil statistics data is in the IA oil information book and the associated databases. But oil data is also used to calculate the energy balances, CO2 emissions, as well as energy efficiency indicators. The data are also used within the IA to conduct analysis and develop forecasts. And they are also used to produce the World Energy Outlook, one of the main publications of the IA. The most commonly used statistics can be found in our easily accessible booklet The Key World Energy Statistics and the associated mobile application. Thank you for listening to us. If you want to learn more about the IEA Energy Statistics, we have a lot of different resources that can be helpful. You will find below the links for our Energy Statistics Manual, which is a comprehensive manual available in 10 languages. You can also visit the IEA Statistics website for a wealth of resources, including our questionnaires, glossary and documentation related to our data collection methodologies. Also, you can have a look at the United Nations International Recommendations for Energy Statistics, which provide a methodological framework and we referenced a lot during the presentation.